Okay, so um, Dr. Tomer Hertz is an associate professor in the Department of Immunology at Ben Garen University in Israel and an affiliate investigator at the Vaccine Infectious Disease Division at the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center in Seattle. Uh, he received his PhD from the Hebrew University in the field of machine learning and pattern recognition and did his postdoctoral fellowship at Microsoft Research working on computational immunology and host pathogen co-evolution. His lab studies the role of immune his, uh, history and its effects on vaccination and natural infection. And then our other speaker, Dr. Amir Aharoni obtained his PhD in 2001 from the Wiseman Institute of Science from the Department of Chemistry. He went on to do two postdocs, the first at the Wiseman Institute under Professor uh, Tofik and the second in Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada at the University of British Columbia under Dr. Withers. Uh, he was then a senior lecturer for six years, then an associate professor for another six years, and is now a full professor at the University of Ben Gurion in Israel in the Departments of Life Sciences. And they'll be sharing with us um, how they harness immunoformatics and protein engineering for de-immunization of therapeutic proteins. You may begin. Great, thank you very much for the introduction. So I hope you can all hear me. I will be starting and Amir will pick up somewhere. And so, um, so we are basically trying to uh, present, we're going to present data for a new approach for therapeutic protein deimmunization. And Amy's talk was very relevant. She already uh, uh, introduced the problem. And the solution that we offer is basically to try to reduce immunogenicity by, while still preserving drug efficacy. And our strategy has been combining our expertise, which is computational and experimental immunology with protein engineering. And there's a IP that's patent pending on this. And so this is from a recent review that just published actually about uh, how immunogenicity is a major problem in protein-based therapeutics. Uh, this is a table just highlighting a few of the um, immunogenic um, antibodies that are now clinically approved. On the top, you can see ones that are for chronic administration, like uh, perhaps the best, uh, the most well-known, which we will describe as Umira. And then on the bottom, you can see uh, uh, cancer-based treatments, antibodies that are uh, given in short um, treatment intervals and short courses, and those have also been now reported to be um, involved in anti-drug antibodies. So this is a highly prevalent problem in many protein-based therapeutics, and of course not just antibodies, as, as Amy mentioned, but also other uh, therapeutic proteins. And, and it's, it's quite clear that uh, the most crucial step to generating an, an anti-drug antibody response involves the CD4 T cell response, that is the T cell help required for generating a B cell response. And, and this is mediated through the interaction of the peptide uh, MHC complex with the TCR highlighted here. And this is where uh, we basically want to uh, interfere. And the case study we will be presenting is, is adalimumab or Humira, the best-selling drug on the market uh, by all uh, categories and means for many, many years now. Uh, and it's well known that this drug uh, suffers from a major anti-drug antibody responses. And in Israel, it's estimated that about 40% of the patients uh, uh, have to, you know, uh, have secondary loss of uh, response due to anti-drug antibodies following treatment with Umira within the first six months of treatment. And so the synergistic approach that we use uh, starts by the identification of validation of the immunogenic hotspots on the protein. So we first want to identify and validate where the CD4 epitopes lie on the antibody of choice, in this case, uh, Humira. Uh, we then use protein engineering to eliminate these immunogenic hotspots uh, using a screen that maintains the wild type activity. Uh, and this is done with a high throughput screening approach that I'm able to describe in detail. And then uh, that allows you to select some active variants. And then we can experimentally validate that they're, they're functional and that they also have reduced immunogenicity so that allows us to basically uh, close the loop and generate these variants that we are interested in that basically uh, reduce immunization. Now, the procedure in more detail can be described as follows. So you start with a target sequence, in this case, the antibody sequence. Uh, we've built some in-house tools for prediction of immunogenicity hotspots, which I'll describe in a sec. Uh, once you identify those hotspots, you experimentally validate them. Uh, using uh, uh, HLA binding assays and T cell assays. And then uh, we can rationally design libraries for high throughput screening using protein engineering to discover active variants that are mutants of the wild type uh, molecule. And then we can choose or select active 
variants that have dramatic reduction in eugenicity. And again, those can be validated experimentally once more to show that they've actually uh, exhibit reduced immunogenicity. So how does one identify these hotspots? Uh, this is a problem I've, I've given, I've worked on in the past. Basically, uh, we've come up with a definition, a statistical definition of what, what is considered an epitope hotspot. And we've shown that these are regions that are presented by multiple HLAs uh, across population. And to do uh, identification of hotspots, we use a combination of HLA class two binding predictors based on that MHC PAN2. And then we also incorporate other information, which is uh, also incorporating frequency of alleles, uh, focusing more on the more frequent alleles in the population. And then we consider uh, epitopes across uh, multiple positions along the peptide. And of course, uh, we also, as others mentioned, um, incorporate similarity to self. What that end up, ends up looking at when you look at Humira, so what you can see here, this is the Humira heavy chain. So the X axis are positions along the heavy chain and the y-axis are uh, various scores pr produced by our method. So on the top, you can see just the number of epitopes. This is the number of HLA alleles that bind to each individual position along the Umira heavy chain. And then the middle track here, which is called the immune score, is a weighted score that also takes into account HLA frequency and scores uh, alleles by their frequency in the population. And then the bottom track here is similarity to self where basically the bars represent the number of peptides in the human proteome that have an identical match to the peptides on the Umira heavy chain. And you can see, for example, that here we've identified two prominent hotspots on the Umira heavy chain, uh, one that seems to have similarity to self and the other that is, is a complete hole in the self repertoire. And so these two regions were previously described also in two independent studies. One was published in a paper and one was actually presented by Premium at a conference at a bioassay summit in 2016. So there was uh, at least some confirmation that these regions were to some extent immunogenic. However, to further validate this, we uh, generated peptides that overlap these regions. And these peptides, including other control peptides marked here in, uh, uh, in other regions that you can see here that are marked with these uh, gray and red bars, were sent uh, uh, to a collaborator for testing IC50 binding uh, to HLAs. So here you can see on the y-axis a variety of different class two HLA alleles. And on the x-axis, you can see again, peptide positions along the heavy chain of Humira and the two hotspots previously identified can be seen to bind. And this is a binding map where like the darker the red color, the stronger the uh, binding is to HLA. And so you can see that these two regions are very strong uh, immunogenic hotspots. Some of them uh, bind um, multiple HLAs with ultra uh, binding affinities. So this was experimental validation just to you know, highlight the fact that the model can identify these regions that they're really highly immunogenic regions. Interestingly, there are also these two other regions that were less immunogenic in our model and indeed were found to bind only to two of the HLA alleles from the panel of HLA that we tested uh, in this specific uh, uh, test. And so now what we want to do is we want to rationally design a library for high throughput screening of single chain uh, uh, FVs uh, using e-surface display. And the, the idea is to uh, uh, mutate uh, the protein uh, and abolish MH2, MHC2 binding while still retaining the TNF alpha binding, which is the major uh, target of the Humira antibody. And so instead of just uh, using a random library, we are going to do semi-rational design of the library based on our computational prediction tools. And then we will use a e-surface display system, which Amir will describe to screen these libraries and finally test to see that those HLA uh, variants really uh, have reduced binding to HLA, uh, which will then prove that we've reduced their immunogenicity. And so uh, we've designed libraries for uh, uh, these two immunogenic hotspots, the two epitope hotspots marked here as Lib1 and Lib2. And uh, to walk you through this design, so basically the process involves multiple steps of filtration. So you start with a library that has the, the first region we identified is 10 residues long. So the total diversity in this region is 10 to the power of 13. Uh, if we now uh, first start with a, a filtering through looking at multiple sequence elements and, and homologous proteins and generating a PFM and look, looking at amino acids that can be, uh, that were observed in these positions in nature. If we just do that and just consider uh, frequently appearing uh, amino acids, we reduce the library here by an order of uh, five orders of magnitude to 10 to the power of eight. We then go through a second filtering stage that involves looking at immunogenicity. And here we analyze each individual amino acid along the 10 positions and consider 
there are all 19 amino acid substitutions that can be uh, replaced and then look at each one of those and ask whether it increases or reduces HLA binding to the alleles that we are looking at in our panel. And when you do this and select only ones that reduce binding, you end up with only 2,250 variants. And finally, the third filtering step includes structural analysis of the mutations to look at ones that would retain stability and predicted function of the Umira heavy chain and the antibody complex itself. And when you do that, you further filter the list from 2,250 to only 750 variants. And this is a logo plot of those variants uh, that are within this rational library that we uh, then screen. Now, now, when the library is of this size, one could argue that you could actually potentially even maybe make all the 750 variants and test them one by one. But this was certainly not the case for Lib2. So in Lib2, we start with a region that's 11 amino acids long. So the total diversity is 10 to the power of 14. But because this region, uh, uh, looking at a position frequency matrix here, you can see that there was hardly any reduction in the library size just looking at uh, possible amino acid mutations in this region. Um, if we then do filter through immunogenicity, we get a dramatic reduction to the 10 power of five, but eventually we end up with a, you know, still a very large number of variants that are encapsulated in this logo plot here. And clearly this is not a library that one could easily uh, uh, just you know, generate uh, every, every variant and, and, and test each, each one of those variants on its own. Okay, and this is where the e-surface display comes in, and I'll pass over, hand over to Amir now. Thank you, Tomer. So we use a e-surface display to screen these libraries. As Tomer nicely described, we have two regions, we have two libraries of different size, and what we do is we display these libraries on the e-cell surface. You can see it uh, over here. So we display it as a single chain uh, variance. And we use a, a flow cytometry to detect binding to TNF alpha. As you can see here, we first validated that if we, we take white acumia and not a library, it we see a fluorescent signal upon incubation with TNF alpha, meaning that we have nice uh, binding and we can detect it uh, by the fax. So the sorting, when we introduce very large library, we display all the library as a bulk. Then we incubate the library uh, with TNF alpha, followed by streptavid in APC, just for fluorescent labeling of the positive cells. And then we sort only the pop top population that binds uh, the TNF alpha, meaning that there are functional variants. And then we sort them into tube. We repeat this process. Uh, to enrich for uh, active variants from these libraries. Here you can see actual data. So for the first library, the Tomer described, we have only 750 variants. And surprisingly, I mean, not surprisingly later on, you will see why, but most of the uh, initial library was already functional and 51% of the initial binding actually, of the initial library actually binds a nice TNF alpha following enrichment of the library, we can see that we can achieve 75% of the clones that are active binders. So this library, again, we can argue that we can screen it uh, easily using non-high throughput screening method. But if we look at library two, that is much more complex. It contains 1.5 million variants. And uh, interestingly, the initial library contained only 0.18% of positive clones. Maybe the, uh, this, the uh, probability of getting an active clone is very low. And here come the power of uh, flow cytometry and high throughput screening. Following sorting of this library could enrich uh, the library uh, to a, a very high proportion so that the majority of positive clones actually binds a, a TNF alpha. Now to rationalize, why, why do we see such difference in the two libraries? We looked at the structure of TNF alpha with a Umira. On the, here you can see Umira light chain and heavy chain, and here is uh, the TNF alpha. And if I highlight the two regions uh, in the antibody that the libraries were generated, library one, over here was generated in the framework, and this region doesn't 
is not in a direct contact with TNF alpha, but library two is actually in the CDR. So it really highlights the exact problem of how do you de-immunize a protein when the uh, immunogenic region is in the active site uh, of, uh, the, in this case, the antibody. And here you can see that although uh, the number of solutions is very low, high throughput screening allows us to fish this solution out and get uh, our desired uh, endpoint, which is active variant with a dramatically reduced immunogenicity. Now, of course, we need to prove uh, that it's uh, less immunogenic, but here first you can see that uh, what we did is functional testing of individual variants because all the sorting and the enrichment is done on a population level. And as we see in the population, a vast majority of variants, more than 90% of the variants were active and they were predicted, again, this is only by computation, to have a reduced, dramatically reduced immunogenicity. Now, to really prove that these variants have reduced immunogenicity, you can see this nice uh, uh, data here that actually shows that if we take, again, the wild type humira, we take the, more, uh, the strongest hotspot that we dealt with, in this project, when we take the uh, variants following engineering and selection, they are, show almost no immunogenicity, uh, especially relative to the wild type, at least two or three orders uh, of reduction in uh, HLA uh, binding. Now, of course, we are uh, pursuing the last step, and this is showing uh, that in T cell functional assay, we see also a reduction in uh, immunogenicity in activation. Now, the next thing that we ask is, uh, and this is regarding region one, uh, that is in the framework, whether other antibodies uses the same framework as Umira, and then they by default contain the same immunogenic region. And indeed, here you can see analysis of 52 therapeutic antibodies that all have detected uh, ADA that have the same framework as Umira. And as a proof of principle, we um, took Ipilimumab, which is an anti-CTLA-4 that is used uh, as a, a cancer therapy uh, for deimmunization as a second example. And we actually performed the same, ah, sorry, this is just some data a nice data that was published in 2018 showing that, that indeed um, when patients develop ADA in the case of uh, uh, anti-CTLA-4, uh, their prognosis for, for survival is much poorer. So ADA positive that you can see here have overall survival that is much lower uh, than uh, ADA negative. And this is also the case for a progression a free survival. So we did the same um, approach. Of course, we won't get into the details, but the end product was again that we could uh, identify variants of ipilimumab uh, that have dramatically reduced immunogenicity, but, uh, but can still uh, very effectively uh, bind CTLA-4, similar to the wild type uh, version. So just to summarize our talk, we show the computational and experimental approach for protein deimmunization. This approach allows us to abolish immunogenicity while preserving full protein function. Uh, we showed it on Umira and Ipilibumab, and we, uh, uh, we can now uh, implement it for any protein uh, of choice. And um, as you've seen from the introduction, uh, there are many, many antibodies that have this problem and they are, we are perfectly geared to address it with this technology. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, uh, Tema and Amir, for your talk and lots of things to think about. In fact, we've got some questions already. Um, so what I'd like to do is, uh, Amy, I can hand over the microphone to you if I can just Okay, so um, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, great. 
So um, th th that was a great talk. Thank you. And um, I just wonder, you know, since there are some sequences that bind to a HLA class two that engage regulatory T cells, um, first of all, do you screen for that? And second of all, um, can you engineer those into the antibody, the monoclonal antibodies, so that they do engage, uh, uh, you know, Tregs uh, that would turn off any potential immune responses? Thank you. So yeah, that's that's a good. I, I think we haven't given any uh, particular attention to Tregs with this analysis mm -hmm. so far. We have just focused on the uh, CD4 binding that would elicit the antibody response. Um, to your, to your question, whether it's possible to engineer in an epitope of choice, certainly that's possible. So if you are interested to, uh, while, like, let, let's say that you had two goals, one would be to eliminate binding to a specific epitope and then also introduce a potential other epitope or increase the chances of that epitope becoming a Treg. If that was a known Treg epitope, that could certainly be done uh, in tandem using the screening approach because it's, it's just a generic platform that allows you to identify uh, active variants and then and then prove that they have the functional properties in terms of the immune response that you're interested in. Thank you, that's, uh, that's great. Um, Tim, I think you have a question as well. Um, let's unmute you. Hopefully you can hear me now. Yeah, we can. Great stuff, thank you. Um, so thanks for the talk. Uh, really nice to see things like the yeast display in there that can handle some of the other uh, developability issues that arise with antibodies. Um, I just wondered how long does it take you to go through the deimmunization process with your system? So yeah, I mean, uh, I think that uh, computationally it's quite fast now because the, the, the platform is uh, established. So any protein of interest, we can put the sequence and analyze it. And uh, also for library generation, we are all geared to, to do it very quickly. Uh, uh, the experimental part is of course, uh, takes uh, longer, but still, I mean, if it's an antibody, uh, I estimate that it's between three to six months and we can uh, uh, move from, uh, even for two hotspots like we showed for Umira, uh, we can move from wild type that is immunogenic to, uh, let's say, de-immunized version of the antibody that showed at least on the level of ESIS play full binding. And because ESIS play is a, is a great predictor for uh, bind, especially for antibodies, uh, we believe it, it's also valid for full IgG. Yes. Hey, thank you. Thank you. Uh, last question uh, is from Daniel uh, Leventhal. Uh, Daniel hasn't got access to his microphone, so I shall ask the question on his behalf. Um, what data or prediction tool is your immune score based on? Uh, NetMHC, HLA affinity data, or MAPS, for example? Right. So it's, uh, so it's an in-house tool that we've built on top of the NetMHC PAN2 predictor at this point. Uh, it doesn't just use the NetMHC PAN2 predictor, but it also uses some other things we've developed in-house. But basically, it would it uh, the sort of the baseline predictor just for HLA peptide binding is based on that MC band two at this point. Okay, yeah, thank you. Um, one quick question as well from Seema. In case of HLA peptide, how to achieve the balance between deimmunized and immunogenic epitopes when actually using in vitro or in vivo? Yeah, so I think it's more comparing in vitro or, uh, to in vivo. Um, so, 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 so I mean, generally speaking, there there's been lots of work showing that uh, in vitro assays for T cells are highly predictive of the immune response in vivo. Um, that's, you know, the standard of, of uh, test as you, you guys know better than everyone is uh, in vitro T cell assays to determine immunogenicity in human PDNCs. Um, so that's, we use what everyone else uses. But of course, the, uh, at the end of the day, uh, the question ends up being clinical, right? So, I mean, if, if there was a variant of a protein that would be developed, uh, the ultimate proof would be to show that when you administer that, you know, antibody, you get a delayed or reduced immunogenic response in patients. And that's, of course, I would say far out, but that's the, the ultimate step. goal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you very much indeed. That's been really interesting to, to see. Thank you. Very much. Thank you. Thank you.